B, C. Man, oh man, it's good to be back. Man, you guys rocked it, man. That's what I'm talking about. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody doing all right? Very cool. Very cool. Well, hey, I got this one. So this is what I'm going to read first. I'm going to read uh, Ladies Bible Study on July 5th. Ladies Bible study, there's going to be a summer project, and that summer project, I believe, is going to have something to do with, like, building bags for the for the homeless uh, people. So, anyways, July 5th, Ladies Bible study, ladies and kids are all welcome. So, moving along. Please turn off all cell phones, or at least put them on silent, and please also... Keep the sidebar conversations to a minimum because we don't want to be a distractor to some, to the people to your left and right, right? So, all right. Uh, good to be back. Yes, absolutely. Jen's not going to be with us tonight. Uh, she's got a low-grade fever, not feeling too well. So she said, you know, I want to err to the side of caution. So she stayed home, but I'm sure she's watching. Hey, Jen. I know she's watching. 100%. So, all right. Uh, let's see. So, the numbers, man. If you guys just look around, look, look at how many people are here, man. This is absolutely phenomenal. We've been averaging, yeah, right? But we've been averaging north of 70 people, right? And, and sometimes we're getting higher, um, sometimes a little lower, but more often than not, we're, we're north of 70. And this is God's house, man. And there has to be order. Right. There's got to be order in the house. Uh, we want people to feel absolutely 100 percent comfortable when they come in. And I think that's one of RCBC's greatest um, one of RCBC's greatest assets is everybody's just so welcoming. Right. But what we're going to ask is we, there's only designated people uh, that go behind the bar. And uh, we're just going to ask for everyone to just remain patient and wait for somebody to come by and help and not go behind the bar and help yourself, because. You know, again, there, there just needs to be order in the house. So just a little housekeeping rule there, but we're going to put that out. And enough said about that. So Frankie's jokes last week, were they okay? I mean, hit miss. Okay, so his email is frankie.molinario at yahoo.com. You know, that's the complaint department too, right? So... Anyways, just wanted to throw it out because I wasn't here. Got to keep my finger on the pulse a little bit. <laughs> That's what we're calling it. All right. So 4th of July, we are going to have an amazing 4th of July party. Usually we do our events that coincide with church service, whether it's a couple days before the 4th, a couple days after the 4th. This year, we are going to do it on the 4th, not church service. Church service will always be on Saturday. But the 4th of July is on Tuesday, and we are going to have a movie night, okay? And we're going to play uh, Jesus Revolution. Even if you've seen that movie, it's that good to where if you see it again, it's going to be worth it, right? And then, uh, if, even if you've seen it, talk to your friend and tell them how amazing it is and drag them here, right? So, anyways, we're going to have movie night. Uh, I believe Helen made some flyers, with, and we'll make other flyers and make a Facebook event. Uh, and then after the movie, it should be nightfall. We'll do just like typical RCBC fashion is we'll go out the back doors. We can bring our chairs. We'll have music. And we'll have some amazing firework displays. So anyways, put it on your calendar. Things to do. Fourth of July. Be here or be square. All right. Moving along. Bible study. How many people we have at ladies' Bible study? Let's go. Thirteen. All right, and regular Bible study usually averages right around 30, okay? So that's pretty amazing for a, a weekday Bible study to have 30 people come in. Even to have 13 people come in is pretty stellar, so we must be doing something right. So come on in, find out for yourself firsthand. RCBC right here, 7 o'clock is uh, Bible study time. But, of course, we open up early and we have food and coffee and all that other stuff, so... Come on in, hang out, get your batteries recharged, uh, get yourself into the weekend. Uh, we do have the state inspector coming. This is a, a cafe, 
Uh, we are registered with the state and all that other stuff, but we got the state inspector coming in Thursday, so keep us in your prayers. Uh, and typically he comes in and, you know, goes through his little deal and everything's been good to go. We haven't had any issues. It's the same inspector. So hopefully he just comes in, is amazed with the place, and he just <laughs> continues on his way, right? Because there's plenty of other restaurants out there that need some inspecting. Anyways, so just keep us on your prayers on that one. Uh, the RCBC print, I've been talking about that. It's a artist rendering of outside of the building with bikes, and it's kind of like got the David Mann-esque um, drawing. Uh, it's completed. It's in the mail. It's on the way to me. And we will get uh, reproductions of it, and it will be available. But we'll also have, of course, we got to have like an unveiling of this, and right, because it's that cool. So stay tuned for that. Uh, it's a bathroom. So we have the ba a bathroom, right? And we'd like to reserve that bathroom for women, children, and people that may. No, that's not the bathroom. That's the mop closet. On the other side, thank you, Frankie. And uh, we'd like to reserve that for for people that might not be able to go out and use the the, the Harvey Honey Hut thing out back, right? But we do have a Porter John out back. We have uh, hand sanitizer over there. So if you're new, that's kind of the lay of the land, all right? Uh, tithes, we don't pass the bucket here. We don't do a 30-minute sermon on uh, giving. But we do have donation buckets in the back. We have a gas tank over there in the foyer. If it's on your heart, please give. We'd like to pay the light bill. But if it's not on your heart, no sweat. Um, God's going to take care of us one way or another. All right. Uh, and sign our walls. If you're new, please, we have a bunch of markers uh, out there. And feel free to sign our walls. Leave your mark. And with that, I think that's about it for my world-famous announcements. So do me a favor. Look to your left, right, front, and back. Give your neighbors a howdy, a head nod, a fist bump, a handshake. Welcome to Redemption Community Biker Church. We're glad you're all here. Woo! Woo! Ka -ka! Okay. 
Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Redemption Community Biker Church. Only in the biker church will you see Def Leppard open the service. Amen. So a lot of people were commenting on my shirt. I'd like to publicly thank Heather for getting me this shirt. Def Leppard was my first album I ever got as a kid, and they still rock. So uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed, um, but... Our worship team has really been working on some things. And uh, I just wanted to, to thank them for all the hours they put in and the, the sacrifices they give to make our music special and, and uh, for the words Heather's been putting up on. I think it, it makes it a lot better. Amen. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we love you. We praise you. I thank you for each person here tonight. I pray that you open your word. You teach us something that we don't know. Lord, I pray you push away the distractions. Help us to focus only on your words and not mine. We love and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, huh? Did I miss something? All right, cool. This is a true account. Okay, this is a true account recorded on the police log in Sarasota, Florida. Okay, so an elderly lady from Florida did her shopping at the local grocery store. My guess it was Publix, just a guess. And upon returning to her car, she found four young male men, obviously, in the act of leaving with her vehicle. Okay, she dropped her shopping bag, she drew her pistol. And she screamed at the top of her lungs, I have a gun. I know how to use it. Now get out of the car. Right? And her name was Anita. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. But listen, the four men, they didn't wait for a second. They got out and they ran like mad. Okay? 
Now, the lady, somewhat shaken, went ahead and loaded her shopping bags into the car and got into the driver's seat. And she was so shaken that she couldn't get her key into the ignition. And she tried and she tried. But then she realized why it wouldn't go in. And it was for the same reason she wondered why there was a football, a Frisbee, and two packs of 12 packs of beer in the back seat. A few minutes later, she found her own car, (laughs) parked four or five spaces down in the row. She loaded her bags into the car and drove straight to the police station to report her mistake. The sergeant, to whom she told the story, could not stop laughing. (laughs) Then he pointed to the other end of the counter where there were four pale young men who were reporting a carjacking by a mad elderly woman (laughs) described as white, less than five feet tall, with glasses, curly white hair, and carrying a very large handgun. No charges were filed. (laughs) Now, folks, here's the moral of the story. If you're going to have a senior moment, make it memorable, right? (laughs) Amen. That's a true story. So uh, last week, in observance of Father's Day, I taught a lesson on fatherhood. Okay, who was here for that? All right, good. And, And as I explained last week, I don't do many lessons on what I call relational holidays. Because really, <laughs> there's no stop to them. You know, Cousin's Day and, you know, my first grade teacher's day. I don't know. Uh, but for some reason, God gave me a lesson on Father's Day that I gave to you guys. And although during the lesson we mentioned a lot of different biblical fathers uh, that were in the Bible, we focused on Abraham. We focused on Abraham. Or as we learned, he was also called Father Abraham. And those of you that grew up in the church, I wasn't one of them, by the way, know that song, right? We're not going to sing it. Okay, so we started out talking about who Abram and Big Jim were, right? I love that picture. We started out talking about who Abram and Sarah were. We learned that Sarah was unable to have children. She was barren. But for some reason, God changed Abram's name to Abraham, which means father to the multitude. We learned it was because God had promised Abraham that he would be a father to many nations. In fact, we didn't even go over this verse last week, but Genesis 15, 5 says this. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, look up at the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And folks, that's why he's father Abraham. But then we paused our lesson on Abraham and we did some soul searching. We talked about what it means to be a father. And I explained how I had done some research about fatherhood and found all kinds of different ideas about fatherhood and what people feel it means. But then I came to a quote from this guy named Ben, who gave us his honest thoughts about what it means to be a father. And the quote was, fathers put others' needs before their own. You can read it this time, right? Fathers put others' needs before their own. They're willing to sacrifice their own comfort for the comfort of their family. Fathers should preside as equal partners with their spouses in the home. And as I said last week, his, his wife put that in there. Okay. They are to protect, protect their family from j- danger. I can't talk tonight. Uh, they are to provide for the needs of their spouses and their family. Fatherhood is the pathway for boys to become men and to raise above themselves and achieve their greatest potential. And after I read that, we agreed that for the most part, Ben's definition of fatherhood was spot on, right? Right? All right, good, thanks. But then we took some time to focus on what Scripture had to say about fatherhood. And when we did that, we found ourselves talking about Abraham again, right? And in Genesis 18, 
verses 18 and 19, it says, For Abraham will certainly become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. And that came true. I have singled him out so that he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, and then I will do for Abraham all that I have promised. And as I explained last week, I believe the reason God blessed Abraham with so many descendants, why he led him to be such a big father figure in our history, and why he made him the father of many nations was because of what God spoke about here in verse 19. We're going to read it again. I have singled him out so that he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. And after we read that verse, I told you that I believe that this idea, above everything else, teaches us what God says fatherhood is. Right? Right? Thank you. I appreciate the help. All right. It doesn't tell us, it doesn't tell us how Isaac was taught by Abraham to climb trees or to build things out of wood or hunt or work on cars or play baseball or anything else that we think fatherhood is, right? Based on what this verse is saying, fatherhood is about directing our children and our families to keep the way of the Lord, right? And then we spent a little time talking about God's statement at the end of that verse. He said, then I will do for Abraham all that I have promised. And I told you we should take note that it was only after Abraham accomplished the task, accomplishing the task of, of directing his family to keep the way of the Lord that God gave him everything else. It was only after he did that, right? But then after he did that, God made Abraham the most famous father that ever lived. And as we close, I read you a short summary of fatherhood. We said being a father is about love, support, mentoring, coaching, encouragement. But most of all, it's about teaching. And according to what we just learned, teaching a child to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. And from what we read in Genesis, that might be the most fatherly thing we could ever do. Okay. Two sermons for the price of one. We ready for part two? Good. So let's get rolling with tonight's lesson. Back in 2018, I taught a series in our church that we called Gods at War. And the series was developed from a book with the same title and was written by a guy named Kyle Eidelman. Now, if you don't know, Kyle also wrote not a fan. Anybody read these books? I highly encourage you to read them. Now, I am a huge proponent of both these books. Notice I didn't say fan, okay? But does anyone remember me teaching these things back in 2018? Two, three, good. All right, so we got a couple. Whew, thank you. So um, 2018 seems like an eternity ago, doesn't it? I don't know about you. I saw a meme yesterday, and it, and it said if 2020 was a meal, and it had two frozen hot dogs and uncooked pasta. And I was like, that's very accurate. But 2018 just seems like it was so long ago. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if you didn't remember it. But we were in that series for five weeks, all right? And the book presented us with an idea. And that idea is that there is a spiritual battle that's happening in every one of us. I don't think anybody would debate that, right? We know that there's a spiritual battle that's happening every day in our lives. But for some reason, we have this idea that the battle is to get sin out of our lives. That's what we think the battle is. We believe that if we could just clean up the garbage and then we can keep the environment clean, that our lives will be much more honoring to God and that we would be better Christians. That's what we think the battle is. Only there's a problem with that. 
The problem is every time we clean up the garbage and we get it out by the curb, over the next few days we turn around and the garbage is back. Right? Just like at the house. So we keep taking out the garbage and we keep putting our hope in what it says in 1 John 1, 9, which is, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. That's what our hope is. And for many Christians, it's just a cycle, right? We sin, we feel bad, we ask God for forgiveness. We sin, we feel bad, we ask God for forgiveness, right? But the reason that we keep having to take out the garbage, the reason the garbage keeps accumulating in our lives is because we never change anything about the source of where the garbage is coming from, okay? We si- we're simply treating the symptoms of the disease and not the disease itself, okay? You guys know what I'm talking about? You ever had the flu, right? The doctor's like, well, can't do much for you. See you later. Pay your $25 copay, right? They give you some cough medicine, right? They, they, they give you some, some Tylenol-3, and they say, I'll see you in a week when the virus has left your body. Because at the end of the day, they're not treating the disease, they're treating the symptoms. And that's what we do with sin in our lives. And the spiritual battle that we're talking about is for what is in control of our hearts. What is in control of our hearts? Because the heart is where all our thoughts, all our emotions, and ultimately all of our actions come from, right? So whatever is at the center of our heart is the source of what grows in our lives. So if the source is manufacturing garbage, the garbage grows, right? If the source is manufacturing godliness, then godliness grows. But as we learned back when we did the series, almost 100% of the time, the root cause of the sin in our lives, the source of the garbage that we're talking about, is idolatry. Idolatry. Now, the moment I said that, most of you pictured people bowing down to statues or burning incense or giving sacrifices to monuments, right? And you hear that, you see the picture, and you're like, Frank, you finally lost it. I am not an idolater. There's no way, right? Folks, that's not what I'm talking about at all. That is not what I'm talking about. Those are easy to spot, okay? If you go into a Chinese restaurant, look up where Buddha is, and there's food. It's easy to spot, okay? If you saw one of your friends bowing down to a golden statue and presenting food sacrifices to it, and then they came and told you they were having problems with with doing bad or unethical things, I think you could help them, right? You'd say, well, bro, you're worshiping a false god. I understand why you're having problems. And if that's what it was, we wouldn't be talking about it because it's easy to spot. But the idols of today are not that obvious. The enemy, you see, the enemy has built idols in the world today that we have no idea are even idols. We have no idea. And they are so strong that they are more than idols. In many cases, these things have become gods, little g, in the lives of millions of people. And although I could easily spend five weeks going through each one of these gods, little g, and giving you extensive lessons on each one like we did back in 2018, we're not going to do that, okay? Instead, I'm going to give you a review of what the gods were that Kyle Eidelman taught us back in 2013, okay? But then, thank you, 
But then we are going to unmask a new God, one that, for whatever reason, wasn't around in 2013, okay? And it wasn't in the book. We're going to unmask a God that I strongly believe has slowly made its way into a prominent part of our lives. So how's that sound? Good. Would have been weird if you said no. All right, here we go. So just as I explained a few minutes ago, our hearts are a battlefield. And I want you to listen to this story because it's going to explain what I'm talking about. And it's a story of a battle that's happening in the life of a woman. So she's a young woman who grew up in our church, let's say. And as the pastor of the church, her family has asked me as the pastor to meet and talk with her. They're concerned because she's about to move in with her boyfriend, right? Common story of today. Who isn't a Christian. So I call her twice, and I leave messages on her phone, but she doesn't return my call. But as I call her the third time, she picks up. She knows why I'm calling, and she tries to laugh it off, right? I can't believe my parents are making such a big deal of this, she says with a nervous laugh. I can picture her rolling her eyes, right? In her mind, this whole thing is stupid. There's nothing to worry about. Well, I appreciate you talking to me for a few minutes. But let me ask you, do you think it's possible that you've got this backwards? What do you mean, she says. I say that instead of making a big deal out of nothing, it could be that you're making nothing out of a very big deal. She laughs again. It's not a big deal, she says. Do you mind if I tell you why I think it is? (sighs) She sighs deeply and gives me her predictions of all the reasons she thinks that I think it's a bad idea. I interrupt her with a question. Have you ever thought about how much moving in with your boyfriend is going to cost you? You mean the cost of the apartment? No, I'm not talking about money. I mean the way your family feels about it, the way your friends feel about it, the pressure you're getting from them. That's kind of a price, right? Yeah, I guess it is. But that's their problem, she tells me. And what's this going to cost your future marriage, I ask. I don't even know if we're going to get married, she responds. I'm not talking about the man you're moving in with. Because statistically, you most likely won't marry him. She understands what I'm getting at. But I push it a little further. How much is this going to cost your future husband? What price will he have to pay for this decision? She stops to consider that. I continue to count the ways that the decision is a very big deal because it's costing her much more than she could possibly know. So here's what I suggest. If you're willing to pay a price, then this must be important to you. It must be a big deal if you're willing to go through all of this to move in with him. I take her silence as reflection, and I finally get to my point. When I see the sacrifices that you're willing to make and the fact that you're willing to ignore what God says about this in his word, It seems to me that you've turned your relationship into a God. What do you mean by that, she says. I explain. A God is what we sacrifice for and what we pursue. From where I sit, you have the Lord God on one side saying one thing, and your boyfriend is on the other side saying something totally different. And you're choosing your boyfriend over God. And the Bible calls that idolatry. And it's a very big deal. She doesn't laugh this time. She says to me, you know, I've never thought about it like that. You see, folks, idolatry isn't just worshiping statues. It's putting anything, and I mean anything, in the same place in our heart as God. And the story we just read 
It's choosing to follow another God instead of obeying what God clearly teaches us to do in his word. Idolatry is more than just a group of sins that we commit. Rather, it's the sin that all other sins come from. That's why I talk to you about the source of the garbage. In Exodus 20, 3 through 5, it says, You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. Now, when you hear that, you're like, what do the kids have to do with it? Let me tell you about how sin affects generations. We call it generational curses. You see, it's not talking about God putting curses on people. It's talking about how an abused person abuses another person. And how that abused person abuses another person. That's a generational curse. On how one divorced family turns into two divorced families, turned into five divorced families. Are you with me? You know, all over Scripture there are names for God. All over. He's called the King of Kings the Lord of Lords, Jehovah Jireh, Deliverer, Provider, Healer, Redeemer. He's called all these things, but I want you to listen to what he's called in Exodus 13, 14. It's something very different. It says, you must worship no other gods for the Lord whose very name is Jealous. Listen to this. Is a God who is jealous about his relationship with you. Did you guys know that was in Scripture? Whose very name is Jealous. Again, when we hear those verses about gods or idols, we think of worshiping statues, right? Or worshiping the Greek gods. Of course we're not going to do that. But folks, it says here that God is jealous for his relationship with us. And no matter how you slice it, the gods we're talking about here are any of the things that interfere with his relationship with us. And that changes the game, doesn't it? Anything that, ch- that affects his relationship with us. So what might these things be, you ask? That's a great question. You're a spiritual giant, brother. Without going into a complete lesson on each one of these, I'm going to list each of the gods that Eidelman teaches about in his book. And as I list them, I want you to seriously consider how these things could become something in your life that you worship or something that interferes with your relationship with God. Okay? So let's go with the God of food. First up, the God of food. Now, I don't know about you, but I can easily see how someone might worship the God of food, right? I I don't know about you, but I can. Hey, by the way, I watched a movie the other day, and they were talking about how good Slim Jims were. Man, I was like, there's my people, right? But we worship food. How can food become the center of our lives? Let me tell you. You ready? What are we having for breakfast tomorrow? Where do you want to go for lunch? What sounds good for dinner? Amen. Now, I know none of you guys have ever asked those questions because you know what it says in Matthew 6, right? Matthew 6, verse 31. So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Of course we don't say stuff like that, right? Folks, everybody in here tonight is guilty of this, right? I know I am. 
How many times have we said those very words that that verse tells us not to say? We love our food. We do. And whether we believe it or not, food can become an idol in our lives. And it can interfere with our relationship with God. If it's sharing part of your heart, it's an idol. The next one's really hard to understand. It's really difficult to understand. It's called the God of sex. I really don't think that I need to say anything more about that one. And I'm looking around the room, and some of you are praying that I don't. Right? Here's the reality, folks. We can see very easily that the world worships sex. And if you doubt this at all, pull up Netflix, and I want you to count how many movies on Netflix have something to do with sex. And if, let's say there's 10,000 movies in there. My guess is that 9,500 of them are going to have sex in them. Amen? Everything in our society is sold as sex. And with that, I'm going to go on to the next one because I'm making you uncomfortable. Next one is the God of entertainment. The God of entertainment. We love to be entertained, don't we? Come on, folks. Tell it. Let's watch a movie tonight. Why don't, why don't we go to one of the theme parks this weekend? Right? Turn the game on. Stop talking. Why don't we play a board game? I hate those people. Human beings love entertainment. We love it. And nothing has changed since the dawn of man except the technology. Let me tell you what I mean. Before Disney, there was the Coliseum. Before movies, there were plays and museums. Before football or basketball, there was jousting. Let's stab each other in the face. Before MMA, there was Greco-Roman wrestling. All throughout history, we have found ways to entertain ourselves, haven't we? The Olympics started in Greece years and years and years ago. And listen, I'm not saying entertainment is bad. It's not. I like entertainment. I like entertainment just as much as you do. But remember, a God is something that becomes so important in our lives that it interferes with our relationship with God. Now, you might be saying to yourselves that entertainment isn't that important to me. Nah, I, can't, I can give it up anytime I want. Who's heard that one? Anybody? Let me ask you this question, though. This one's going to hurt. How much time do we spend with entertainment in comparison to the time we spend with God? If we're honest, we know there's a big difference, don't we? Listen, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. That's not my goal. I just think it's easy to see how we can become so preoccupied with entertainment that our relationship with God suffers. Actually, it can become an afterthought. Or how it was the case in my life, it became a burden. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. I don't know about you, but I used to think of my relationship with God as a burden. If I was in church, I was thinking about the game, baby. Right? I didn't want to be reading my Bible. Those were things I did out of obligation. I love God, but I want to have fun. I counted the minutes that I was doing those things so that I could get out of that thing and go do something I wanted to do. Who knows what I'm talking about? If we're honest, right? Man, I want to be fishing. I don't think I need to talk more about that. We need 
So recognize how prevalent the God of entertainment is in our lives. So the next three, we're going to group together, okay? The next three, we're going to group together. And some of you went, thank goodness, because he's taking forever, right? They are the God of achievement, the God of success, and the God of money. Now, the reason that I've grouped them together is they're very similar. And now that I've listed them, I'm sure you can see very clearly how these three gods can easily distract you in a relationship with God, right? Anybody? We all know people, or we might even be people, who have put money or achievement or success before God. And many of us know that there's a popular verse in Scripture that talk about this very thing. Again, we're reading from Matthew chapter 6, but this time it's verse 24. And it says this, No one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Now, that verse is talking specifically about money, right? But we could easily alternate the word money with success or achievement. The reality is, in most cases, they're very similar. Success and achievement lead to money. Money equals achievement or success, right? In today's society, money is how many people keep track of how successful they are. I have this much money, you have this one, right? That's how we keep track. Did you see my boat? Right? Did you see my Harley? Did you see that? I do want to point something out, though. There is one place where they're very different. There are times when the drive for success or achievement have nothing to do with money. Sometimes it has more to do with the recognition of others, right? Or it has to do with the addiction for perfection. That's when it's very different. Sometimes it has to do with feelings of superiority, right? And in these cases, the gods of achievement or success are very different than money. But make no mistake about it, they are gods nonetheless. So let's move on. The next one is the God of romance. The God of romance. Now, as soon as I said that, at least a few of you went, are you kidding me? The God of romance, Frankie, give me a break. Like me, you probably thought of Fabio. That's what I thought of. Right? On the cover of a romance novel. Right? But listen, stay with me here for a minute. Don't, don't, don't leave yet. You see, the God of romance isn't a person. The God of romance is an idea. Our culture, next verse, or next slide, our culture holds up romantic love as the greatest and noblest of pursuits. And we are led to believe that in order to experience true happiness in this world, we must find that one special person who was created for us, right? And we have to spend or sacrifice whatever it takes to find our soulmate. And folks, many people spend years of their lives unhappy or depressed simply because they haven't found someone to share their life with. The God of romance is so strong that even after people find the one, even after people find the one, they leave the one because the pull of another one is too strong for them to resist. Do you know how many divorces Facebook costs? Oh, yeah. Oh, there's such and such from high school. Right? Folks, the God of romance is a billion. People, man or woman, swallow it hook, line, and sinker. They swallow it all. In 1996, there was a movie released, and it was called Jerry Maguire. 
in American theaters all over the country, right? It made Cuba Gooding Jr. a household name, right? And show me the money became a very common catchphrase. You guys remember? But three words that Jerry Maguire said to Dorothy Boyd took the romance world by storm. And those three words were, you complete me. You complete me. There's not a person on earth that could convince me that the God of romance isn't an opponent of God. The pull of romance is so strong. It wants control of our heart. The idea that life without true love isn't worth living is a direct contradiction to God's word. Yet people fall for this lie day after day after day. We do. And you may not feel it if you're with someone right now, but if you're single, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Right? Now, the next God is the God of family. Oh, how are you going to do this, Frankie? How are you going to do this? Family is a great thing. Family can be an amazing blessing. But familiar relationships are never supposed to take the place of our relationship with God. There was an analogy that was in Kyle's book that I want to share with you. And I think as bikers, many of you will appreciate it more than most people. Okay? He said, picture it this way. Your life is a wheel. Every spoke in the wheel represents significant relationships that make up your life. One spoke represents mom. One spoke represents dad. One spoke represents one of your siblings. One spoke represents your spouse. One spoke represents a child, and on it goes, right? And our tendency is to make God a spoke in the wheel. That's our tendency. But folks, God isn't interested in being another spoke in the wheel of your life. God is to be the center hub that all the spokes come from and connect to. Did the bikers like that one? Yeah, our family, don't get me wrong, our family should be very important part of our lives. But we are never to put family above God. Another way to think of this is this way. According to the Ten Commandments, we are to honor our parents, but we are only to worship the Lord our God. In Luke 14, 26, it says this. If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father and mother, wife and child, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. Now, does Jesus want us to hate our father and mother? Of course not, right? But God must come before them. You see, what people do is when they have these relationships, whether it's their marriage or their children, is we, we put them in place of God. That's what we do. Oh, I'm complete now. Right? And putting our family in the place of God leads to unrealistic pressure on our children and our spouses. It leads to unnecessarily or unnecessary disappointment. It leads to undeserved criticism, unfair comparison. And if you think about it, it makes sense because we are asking our family to be God. We are leaning on them to make us happy. And they are not meant to fill this role. They are not prepared or equipped to be the center of our world. And when we try to make it work that way, it's no wonder we're so disappointed. Because they're going to fail. Now listen, before we unmask the new God, all right, that I became aware of this week, 
is one more God that Idleman talks about in the book. But, unfortunately, we've run out of time. So, folks, tune in next Saturday for the exciting conclusion to our series, God's at War. Amen. All right. So, folks, there are just a few more things that we got to do before we close out tonight. If you can hang me with me for a few minutes. First, we tell people here how they can come to Jesus Christ. That's our mission. That's our focus. We teach them how they can become a child of God. And then secondly, we open up the service for those who need prayer or who want to come forward. So if you need prayer or you want to come up for support or a hug or anything like that, that's what we're here for. Then last, we pray together for the things in our congregation that people have asked for prayer for. They're over there in that box. And we do that because of what it says in Isaiah 56, 7. It says, I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem, and I will fill them with joy in my house of prayer. I will accept their burnt offerings and sacrifices because my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But before we get to that, I want you to know more than anything else, what Romans says about becoming a child of God. The book of Romans, written to the Romans. Very difficult to understand. Romans 3.23 teaches us, for everyone has sinned and falls short of the glory of God. Everybody's a sinner. I know that surprises most of you this morning. Romans 6.23 tells us that there's a payment that must be made for sin. For the wages of sin is death, spiritual death, separation from God. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, that's good, but how do you do it? It's a great question. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's by believing in your heart that you're made right with God and by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. Romans 10, 13 everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Folks, that's the message. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's what we're here for. And if there's anybody here who hasn't confessed Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray that you do that because it will be the best decision you ever make. So I'm going to be up here for just a few minutes. My breath's playing. Aaron's going to come over here on my side. If you need prayer, come on up. That's what we're here for. I've told you many times before, I don't have any special powers, but my big brother does. So come on up if you need to.
So I don't know about you, but I love the response in our church. Amen. It takes guts to walk up here. So Jen's not here, and she's much nicer than I am. But we're going to take the prayer request, and we're going to pray for them right now. Because as I said, God's Word tells us that His house will be a house of prayer. So Lord, right now we come to you and we pray for Kevin, who's got a stroke, Lord. We pray for recovery in his life. We pray that you heal him. Lord, you would restore his body back to what it needs. Lord, we continue to pray for Bruce as his body is recovering from a stroke. We pray that you guide and direct in his life as to what he should do next. Lord, we pray for Jen as she's at home sick tonight and pray that you take the fever from her, take the sickness from her. Bless that family for their service to you and for their focus on you, Lord. We pray for members traveling to have trip away from home and, and to come back to RCBC safely. We pray for Ivy's finger to heal and to heal properly and to get better quickly so that she can use that hand again. Lord, we know that there are many prayer requests that weren't mentioned, but regardless, we listen to you and you know put our trust and our confidence and our hope in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, thank you for coming out tonight. We love you. Be careful this week. Watch out for the rain. And we'll see you here next Saturday. Have a great week.